Right, so a warm welcome to all. This is day one of our new lecture series, uh, Great Minds and Heritage and Historic Houses. I'm really thrilled to have such a wonderful panel of speakers from all over the world. And um, it is my intention to really also build bridges between, um, between Asia and the West. And um, I hope that this event will also result in po potential collaborations, new projects and exchange of ideas. So thank you very much for coming. And you know, I like to, um, to have this event uh, very interactive. So I also um, um, you know, urge you, the audience, please introduce yourself, say where you come from, because especially during the pandemic, and I just said, I've really been kind of stuck on campus for the past year. I think this is a nice opportunity for us to meet our colleagues. And I must say during the pandemic, I actually met a number of new friends um, that I might otherwise not have met. And I was able to participate in so many fantastic events and see what is happening in the heritage sector and the museum world all over the, the world. Um, so I'll just give a brief introduction, uh, very brief, because um, I don't want to take too much time away from our speakers. And because we've spread out the event over the week, so this is basically an introduction and an explanation what I thought and what my intention was with this lecture series. Let me just share my screen. Objects and subjects, global contexts and multiple histories, dilemmas and opportunities for historic houses. So the title is really linked to the entire lecture series and, um, and the lecture series is linked to events that were going on um, such as the pandemic and you know, serious events and political events and also are linked very closely to the establishment of the Center for Historic Houses in 2019. So we have divided the event in these four areas because all of them are associated with historic houses and sometimes the people who are involved in these areas don't necessarily talk with the same language, don't necessarily have the same goals. And I think it is important for us to talk to each other. And um, you might be surprised that there is no overall theme, but the theme is actually the people of the institutions and the historic houses, because I think it is really the time to ponder what we are about and what we want to achieve and to what extent we might have to redefine you know, our goals. So today we are starting with a panel on historic houses, museums and curation. And of course it is a whole, the whole question about exhibition practice, curatorial practice. What is the difference between a museum and a historic house? In the Indian context, the Center for Historic Houses um, um, is currently trying to establish a network for palace museums, historic house museums. The term such is not really used in the Indian context. So we are looking at um, you know, exchange of ideas and also collaborating with our colleagues in, in the West. I'm really pleased uh, that Jean-Baptiste uh, will be involved in some of the workshops we are planning to do. And I'm very excited about this. The other aspect is heritage education, heritage interpretation. This is a field I think that is very much needed in India. There's not so much, especially not so many opportunities for children. And especially now with the pandemic, we really hope to engage with children also in a digital way and um, to really use this as an opportunity for local history. And of course, heritage management and entrepreneurship. In our context, we have invited owners of historic houses to talk about their ideas because this is also very different and, and people are sitting in a different boat from someone who's working for an institution and might not be concerned about the survival of the house you know, during the pandemic. And many people have actually lost their houses during the pandemic. Many museums will also never open their doors again. We shouldn't forget this. And um, finally, we have a panel devoted to conservation. So we started our online initiative during the pandemic with this new lecture series, Resilience Historic Houses and Their Custodians. And our audience was particularly interested in Asian studies, Asian histories. And um, also um, we were giving a platform 
to the erstwhile royal families and the princes, Maharajas, who disappeared from public life after independence. And um, I'll go a little bit into this. So today is a little bit experimental because our audience is different. And of course, we are all really interested in audiences as well. And you know, how we should, how we can best engage them and what we should offer. And maybe the audience can also be wrong at times. You know, if I think of, let's say, um, Auschwitz concentration camp and dark tourism, we had uh, cases of people kissing in, in, in the gas chamber. Uh, how do we deal with uh, such problematic behavior and difficult histories as well? So you might be surprised that there is no overall thematic approach. And the reason behind the title is that the historic houses themselves and those who care for them should be the focal point of our discussion. The houses and their custodians, whether owners, curators or managers, and either their families or associated institutions. And we should use this also as a time for celebration and reflection to see what went wrong and what can be improved, what were the challenges. So recent debates and events from the pandemic to political events have caused us all to rethink our roles and the purpose and contributions of the historic houses and the institutions we are associated with. And we really have a number of institutions today and many of them are very, very well known, but do we really know about their intention, their purpose? the program hi I'm very sorry about the network problems and um, if this cons uh, if this persists I would suggest that the speakers are uh, starting so um, let me just reconnect sorry um, I hope I hope you're able to see uh, the screen and, and hear me. Yeah. We can see and hear you, Esther. Thank you. So the purpose behind the lecture series is to build bridges and to enter discussion, not only between Asia and the West, but also between the various stakeholders involved in the care, promotion, revival, and interpretation of historic houses. And sometimes these roles and discourses can differ profoundly, as we've seen in, in the press and social media over the past few um, uh, weeks. So, no, I just uh, didn't work. No. So, the areas of the Center for Historic Houses are, of course, represented also in this lecture series. We are interested in research and but we are not only satisfied with this, because we are interested in business models and how these business models can actually be opportunities for local communities and but also non-visitor related, especially during the pandemic. We are really interested in visitor experience, heritage interpretation, lifelong learning, interior design, and many other um, ideas to improve the experience of the visit of historic houses. And we, uh, we are particularly interested in for forming partnerships both with owners of historic houses and colleagues both in India and abroad. For us, it is important that the historic house is connected to um, social issues. We really see them as a catalyst of social change. And we want to address some of the very fundamental issues that are important to society at the moment, such as, for instance, water and heritage, aspects of pollution, sustainability. And that's what we did with our workshop, um, on international workshop on uh, water and, and, and heritage, working particularly with ICOMOS that has really been spearheading this research on water and heritage in the Netherlands. And what we uh, found when, we, when I started the center in 2019 is um, a building, such a beautiful um, building, mm -hmm. such as this one, Deeg Palace, one of the most, uh, the best examples of water palaces in India. When you come there, you can't spend one rupee to benefit the local community. There is no shop, no cafe, it's really just the building itself. 
And if we see something like that, then I really feel, you know, I, <laughs> my hands are itching. I really want to do something. And I feel it's such a lost opportunity. And um, I was talking to um, Amy Kasman from the Financial Times when we were organizing the Water and Heritage um, um, excursion as part of the um, um, conference. And she actually then was interested in it and went to it and confirmed what I had told her. But we also have other great examples, which is a private board and um, part of the uh, first while royal family of Jordan. And um, here we have a kind of a house that is very well managed. We have a museum shop, we have a um, um, cafe, and we also have a gallery space and even a visitor center. So you see really many different um, approaches to heritage and some with more potential and others that are really fully um, developed. And this is one of the very best examples I find in India. Very often when we talk about historic house museums in India, we don't really have collections. We have just the rooms and the rooms in itself, the house in itself is the museum. Um, and it's, it's particularly the, um, the artwork, for example, the wall paintings such as in Bundi, which has been well document, uh, documented by Milo Beach, for example. In City Palace, where we're going to hear more about um, in, in a minute, which also has a gallery space and the actual rooms that you can visit. If we talk about historic houses and palaces in India, of course, we think about the Maharajas. And there is a huge interest in the Maharajas. And we have this vision of their fascination with gems, uh, Rolls Royce, huge palaces. The Jodhpur Palace is one example uh, to um, provide work, actually, for people in the early 20th century. So it's, only, um, it's not the full part of the, the full story that we see, but there are underlying um, you know, social issues at, um, at hand. And, these uh, fantastic collections um, from the Mughal period, for example. However, the situation of owners and how they are portrayed is really ambivalent. So we see them to some extent in the context of tourism, um, but we also have a very serious engagement. That's what we really want to promote um, with the Center for Historic Houses by looking at their collections and studying them. So we've had a number of interesting exhibitions, one at the Musée des Arts Décoratifs in Paris on um, uh, the, the Maharaja of Indoor and his um, um, modernist palace or um, you know, the Altani collection and an important co uh, exhibition also at the V&A. So this is the more interesting part, which goes beyond this kind of voyeurism, uh, but to really look at the people in context the material architectural history. So this again, you see this, and it's also really the theme is exploited in a way in, um, you know, um, in the business world, in the tourism world. How can we connect these different worlds, the academic world, the research, the museums, and um, houses not only in India but elsewhere and we felt that, that there is a need to promote the idea of historic houses beyond I'm very sorry about the internet problems. I would suggest um, um, to hand it over to the next speaker um, because it's very disrupting for you. So with what I've said, basically, there are so many uh, potentials um, of collaboration, of looking at different angles um, 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 at the historic houses. And I'm really curious to hear your particular views on exhibition practice. And of course, with the Louvre, we don't only have the kind of world's most visited museum, but we also have a museum that has a history related to a palace. So uh, Jean-Baptiste, Jean if you could take over, um, and um, I'm very excited uh, about your participation. Yeah, thank you. Do you all hear me? Yes, it's yes. perfect. Uh, is it possible to put the, the PDF online so that people can see? And I, I say next when we have to flip, um, to flip it. Yes, if you uh, use a share screen, uh, yeah, so actually, uh, Esther, I, I, I've got that. I've got your, uh, the presentation. I'm just going to share my screen. Um, oh, uh, you go, sorry, but I think you need to make me a host to share the screen, Esther. 
Right. Okay, all good. Okay, so can Hello. everyone see the presentation? Yes. Uh, at least I see it. So okay, that's I'm great. Just, yeah, I'm just gonna mute myself and just let me know when you'd like me to go to the next slide. Oh, you, you can go to the next now. <laughs> um, so the first thing to know about Asia at the Louvre is, is that it's theoretically not supposed to be there. Um, the National Museums of France have rearranged their collections in the 1950s, and uh, several museums uh, gave at this moment their Asian collection to only one, that was the Musée Guimet, and the Louvre was one of them. And then the Musée Guimet, in return, uh, gave all his Egyptian antiquities to the Louvre. So the Louvre has all Egyptian antiquities of the national museums in France. So the idea was to gather all collections on one place, because we had this idea at the time, uh, all over Europe, that civilization, civilizations more or less matched countries. Uh, it was a, It is now a vision that is completely out of date, but uh, it shaped our museums. So the, the, the biggest part of the, of the Asian collection of the Louvre left the Louvre, uh, especially the, the porcelain collection of Grand Didier. But as you see on the screen, there is still uh, Asia there. On this picture, if, you're, if you have a trained eye, you will recognize uh, on the background, the blue vases are Chinese mounted porcelains. Uh, the furniture uh, on the back and on the left, they are uh, French furniture made out of um, Japanese lacquer, export lacquer that were that were um, reused by uh, workers, um, craftsmen, um, uh, what we call the Marchand Mercier in the 18th century Paris. Uh, next slide. Uh, the idea was to use an Asian basis to create uh, marvelous objects, ab absolutely useless, by the way, as you see these two UOLs that cannot be used for anything but decoration. And um, so we still have some objects. That's the point. Everything that looked uh, purely Asian got to the Musée Guimet, but we, we retained everything that was including parts of Asia. So actually, Asia is there and not there at the same time, but we have no Asian rooms. So one of our main challenges right now with the rise of Asia is that um, the Louvre is supposed to be the, 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 the world museum, but we don't have Asia and, and other, other parts of the world, by the way. But this is the, the, the thing that is most noticed by people. People come to us and say, where is Japan, where is China, where is India? And uh, actually, it is everywhere. Next slide. So there you have other examples the, of, of Japan, Japanese art being reused. So again, lacquer panels. And on your right, uh, it's porcelain bottles. But what is interesting in, in these porcelain bottles is that the, on, on them, you, you won't see it on the screen, but there is some yellow. And uh, this yellow is actually uh, integrated in the Japanese porcelain in, the, 18th, in the, the, the end of the 17th century, sorry. And uh, because of contacts with the West and technical exchange with the West. So actually, we have another layer of Asia uh, in, um, in the Louvre, which is the contact between Asia and Europe and the technical exchange. When you see a porcelain in, in Europe, it's basically a production that was started to concurrence the, the, the massive imports of Asian porcelains. So Asia is there through many, many, many layers, but still no rooms. Next slide. So in front of you, uh, you have two major examples of what we kept. Uh, this uh, lacquer uh, uh come from the collection, the personal collection of Japanese lacquer of Marie Antoinette. 
And uh, the Cornetto vase you see on the right uh, is an export porcelain from China that was made for the regent of France. So he was the he was managing the the throne uh, during the the king's use, and this is this is uh, marked with the crown of France and the armorials of the regent. So basically, uh, these objects have completed their place in the Louvre. Uh, next slide. And then I show you something completely different. It is the rooms dedicated to Mughal art in the Islamic art department. Again, we have a very strange vision, uh, a very classification-based vision in museums, meaning we want to organize collection by separating them between cultural area. But as everyone that works on South Asia right now knows, you can't take uh, the South Asian area of the 17th till 19th century and consider it uh, separately with uh, Hindus on one side and Muslims on the other side. That makes no sense. But that's what we do in museums. So uh, I take this example at the Louvre, but actually it's done everywhere. You have Mughal art somewhere and you will have Hindu art or um, Indian art uh, somewhere else. And this, this di division shows the limits of the vision we had in the past of uh, what is what in terms of civilization, Me meaning every, everything that is mixed is problematic when you think only with classification. Like the diversity and the, the way in which cultures are mixed together is completely erased by this classification. But this classification is also helpful to manage collections. So there is a, a tension between the practical thing, we have to build a room and how do we name it? What do we put inside? And on the other side, the complexity of culture that can never be fully um, acknowledged in a museum room, or unless you write thousands and thousands and thousands of, of pages of texts that you, you put on the wall and we won't do that. Next slide. So the, this is uh, some example of our Mughal collection. I, I put this dagger here uh, in the center, first of all, because I'm fond of these daggers, but also because our inventory number is R, R for Rothschild, and I, I will tell you more about this soon. Next slide. So this is the, the Presidentiel, and now I, I come to the, what I would call the future of our museum. So as you understood, uh, we have some Mughal art in the Islamic art department, and in my department of decorative art, we have some Chinese Japanese things of the 17th, 18th century. But those are presentations that are not dedicated to Asia. And on the other side, there are collections that remain in the museum and that are made of Asian art and that are not gone uh, to Guimé because the, the people that gave them to us uh, made that with a provision that the objects stay in the Louvre forever. So right now, what we, we are planning to do is to show again those collections that have remained in the storage for quite a long time. So the first of this collection is the Thiers collection. Uh, so Thiers was the first president of the French Republic in, in 1871. Next slide. Uh, can, you, can you change slide? Yeah, thank you. So uh, here, a little treat for the, the amateurs. Uh, on the left, you see a Falun Tsai bottle. Uh, so it's the, the best of the best of the best of Chinese painted porcelain. You can't see anything better in the world. And this bottle, especially among this Falun Tsai, is one of the best, if not the best. So we are very proud to have it, and I enjoy it so much. Uh, on the on the upper right, uh, you will see a cup. It is a J cup made in India and sent as a diplomatic gift to the Emperor of China. And uh, all these objects belong to the Thiers collection, uh, which came in the museum in 1884. 
And so the, this cup you see on, on, on top is very interesting because it shows the intra-Asian contacts. And as I told you that we have this classificatory, classificatory way of seeing the things, there is also this Eurocentric uh, tendency which makes that even when we are looking at the world history, we see it through the movement of Europeans to, in the world, and we tend to ignore uh, the other type of movements. And so this object is very interesting for us because it, it is a reminder that looking at Asia is not just looking at uh, the, the European um, trade companies, the VOC and others, but also uh, we have to look at what was moving uh, in Asia, who was moving it, uh, which country, which powers, which commercial systems. And that, that's what's very interesting. And through the chair collection, we hope to be able to show those things. So we plan to, to present again the chair collection in a, in a new room. Next slide. And, um, oh no, actually go back to the previous one, excuse me. Um, thank you. Um, the, the Thier collection was actually a gift from Mi Mr. Thier to the state with the provision of a wife uh, being able to, to keep it until she dies. And then her wife died and made the same provision uh, considering her sister. So in the end, we have a triple gift of the ASEAN collection of Thier, plus the rest of the Thier collection, plus the porcelains of his wife and some objects of his uh, sister-in-law. And our new plan is to create one room for each of them, uh, while we actually have only two and not organized this way, so that we can show what was the taste of uh, each of them for, for art and especially for ASEAN art. Uh, in the 19th century. So we have this project to show the collector's taste and their relationship to Asia, and also to explain the history of the objects, how this cup moved from uh, India to China and then to France, and in France, what it was doing there and who bought it. We, don't, we still don't know how, how Thier came into possession of these artifacts, but we are working on this type of history and we, we plan to tell that. So this, this uh, presentation of Asian art will be uh, for Thier very, very much focused on the history of objects and through the history of objects and the collectors showing the, the global history of Eurasian relationship and also intra-Asian. Next slide, please. We, we have a second collection that stayed in the Louvre because of legal provisions. It's the Rothschild collection. Uh, I showed you uh, a dagger in the Islamic art depart department that was uh, from this collection. And actually the, the Baroness uh, Adèle Salomon de Rothschild who gave her collection to the Louvre um, in 1922 uh, gave us a large amount of jade and Asian artifacts. Uh, the, the picture you see on the right is a curiosity cabinet in a former uh, private house in Paris. And this cabinet is the, is the, the twin of our collection, meaning uh, the, you have half of the collection there, half of the collection at the Louvre. And so we're working with them uh, the, the institution in charge with preserving this cabinet to identify the history of the objects and try to understand again what it meant to, to build such a collection. So the, the Baroness left ve uh, has, has lived very long. So even if she died in 1922, actually the collection was made in 1864. So practically at the same time as the Thier collection. So by dedicating a room to, to her, we will show what is a female collector. And this is very important that we, that we show female collectors because they are more and more studied. And this is very important. And um, also, we will have a comparison collection. We will have the tier objects, tier uh, Mr. Tier, Mrs. Tier, and tier uh, sister-in-law, and then uh, a room for uh, the Baroness. 
And what is also interesting is that the, um, the Jade patient uh, of, the, of the Baroness uh, em is embodied in two collections in the Louvre. And by creating a room dedicated to her, we will show this history of the objects and also the fact that they had an history before entering the Louvre, that they were in a private hotel, and that at the time there was no divide between Chinese jade and Mughal jade. They were shown in a symbol in the single uh, presentation because what was interesting for the collector was pure, purely jade and the technique, the decoration. But this divide between uh, Islamic Indian art and Chinese art was not relevant in her thinking. So uh, showing her collection this way will be a way for us to show that even if our um, modern museography may be fixed, there are other ways to sing them. And one of my uh, teachers a long time ago um, told me that um, curators pass and collection stays. And it's very, very true. What I am doing now with my colleagues to present this collection this way will be probably undone in 50 years or 40 years. And also, if I'm doing this, it's because I've been trained in the years that, that are just gone with the thinking of our time and with the preoccupation of our time, and for the Louvre uh, right now, Asian uh, publics and satisfying them is a major preoccupation. And so museum change over time because the, the look we have on the objects, the look we have on civilization evolve. We learn from the past, we learn more, we, we change our perspective. And it's, it's an interesting lesson that, gave, that my teacher gave me about this, is that we, we should stay humble about um, the shortcomings of our museums. We, are, we don't have that much time to change things. Uh, that much time to to rewrite history in objects because the historians can write books, but we have to move entire rooms and con and make construction work when we change things in museums. And so we have to do our best, but it takes time, it takes money, and so we have also to accept that we can't be up to date as much as we would like. Um, and uh, just. After to finish that next slide, a little treat again. One of the jade masterpieces of the Rothschild collection, and as you see, it's absolutely marvelous. Uh, the uh, this piece is is just wonderful, and that that's also the pleasure we have when we put to light objects that have not been seen by the public for a very long time. Is that we we can offer them. Uh, the possibility to enjoy marvels like this. Um, yeah, um, Mimi, I don't know if we if we have questions now or if the other speakers. And I, I would suggest that we continue uh, with the talks. Thank you so much for this fascinating insight. I think it's really mm -hmm. super interesting to hear this aspect of um, the Asian art collection at the Louvre as opposed to the um, oh. Musée de Guimet. And also I mean, the treat that you provided for us, seeing these fantastic objects, um, that was really, really wonderful. And we are really grateful to you. Thank you so much. Um, I would like to ask Rina Lini now um, to talk about uh, the City Palace Museum in Jaipur. And um, okay. I'm particularly happy to have you also as a speaker to look at this um, typology of the Palace Museum. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Um, I shall share my screen. So I don't have a brilliant network, so that's why I'm not turning on my video. But could you let me know if you can see what um, see the PowerPoint? Yes, PP, PPT is there. Perfect. Yeah, I'm just waiting for it to start the slideshow. It's being a bit slow. Bear with me, please. Okay, there we go. Wow. Beautiful. The Maharaja Savai Mansingh II Museum is housed within the city palace complex of Jaipur. There are serious perks to working in this space, such as being able to call this wonderful building that you can see on, on the screen, 
um, it's known as the Mubarak Mehel, um, and I'm lucky enough to call it my office, as, as are my colleagues. It was originally constructed in 1900 to receive foreign guests in what was then the outermost courtyard of the complex. It points to the paradox that although much of the palace complex was intended for public use, the city palace was not in and of itself envisaged as a museum whether that's our contemporary understanding of museums, which is of course evolving. I think our next speaker, and which I had the pleasure of visiting in 2019, was consciously created as a showcase for a collector's aesthetic passions, or indeed the Louvre that we've just heard about, which is a different piece altogether, even though both those examples contain much royal and princely heritage within their collections. For those who might be unfamiliar with Jaipur, the city was founded in 1727 by Savai Jaising II, who moved his capital from the fortified palace of Amir to a less defensible position on, in the plains, but one that was on key trade routes within the Mughal Empire, and uniquely for its time, a planned city. And that's a detail from uh, a map dating from the, the 18th century that shows you the city of Jaipur uh, with the, the white complex in the middle being the city palace. The city flourished and benefited from his wide-ranging military and diplomatic career in the empire, as well as his intellectual pursuits, notably in astronomy, and so on with each successor. The museum collections, therefore, are driven at the core by the individual quests and interests of successive rulers of the Jaipur royal family. And the museum itself is located in the heart of the city, Savai Jaising II founded. Such a situation has both strengths and weaknesses. On the one hand, being so closely tied to successive reigns allows us to organize and present our material cohesively or somewhat cohesively. And on the screen, you can see a portrait of Savajay Singh. Uh, there's the, the, the detail of the kind of busy uh, scene on the field. He, he's sitting there in a tower. You can just about spot him with, with a red turban and a green angarka. And that's on the field outside the palace. He was a, he was a great um, supporter and player of polo. And the family in general is, in fact, they're known as amongst the best polo players in the country. And at the bottom is a drawing of the Janta Mantra, um, which is, th this is the one in Jaipur. It's a series of observatories that he built to fix some astronomical tables that were a bit wonky. Uh, but anyway, um, what happens, though, is that international events like art and feminism, for example, present an annual headache for us because we struggle to find objects that would be relevant to the conversation without being repetitive, because we can't avoid the fact that women are less visible in the collections as are, for example, non-elites or non courtly contexts. The background to the founding of the museum is also an important factor in how we understand this unique type of historic house, if we were to call it that. India, as you will be aware, gained independence from British colonial rule in August 1947. But what many of us do not realize is that this meant independence for those provinces directly ruled by the British. The princely states, although many of them had acceded to the Indian Union by that date, were integrated over a much longer period of time. Rajasthan, of which Jaipur state became a part, took to 1950, and some regions such as Indian Punjab took over a decade more. This his rather well-known wife, Gayatri Devi, in the Sabanivas of the City Palace, we think on the first occasion of Republic Day being celebrated. This was in 1950. Sivan Man Singh II, who is famous as the glamorous polo-playing Maharaja of Jaipur, established the museum in 1959. Although we know from archival correspondence at the National Archives of India, that he was mulling over the idea of throwing his palace open to the public as early as 1951. The museum first opened as the Maharaja of Jaipur Museum. It was refounded in Savai Man Singh's name by his son, Brigadier Maharaja Savai Bhavani Singh, after his father's death in 1971. And on the left, you can see a cover of the book that the Trust has just published as a biography of Savai Bhavani Singh. He was famously called Bubbles because of the quantities of champagne uh, that were drunk at his birth, because it was the first birth in about 100 years. Previously, um, his, his immediate predecessors had been adopted. So a full discussion of the interpretive possibilities that this raises, that is the meaning and value of retaining an independent artistic identity for Jaipur by establishing a palace museum is outside the scope of this talk. 
But it points to some characteristics that are unique to palace museums in India, which is a generalization, yes, but it's one I'm basing on my experience of having worked for several of them. I've already noted that the museum is physically located at the center of historic Jaipur, which is generally re referred to as the Pink City because of the terracotta wash applied on its walls to mimic the more expensive red sandstone of imperial architecture. But in addition, it also remains at the metaphoric cultural heart of Jaipur. It is still the place from which annual festivals and celebrations commence. And through the collections of the museum, it is the preeminent showcase of the city's artistic heritage and credentials and princely connoisseurship. It is also a working palace and remains the residence of the Jaipur royal family, who are the trustees of the museum. Running a museum is not the only thing they do, and some of the palace remains privately owned by the family, which explains why visitors access a mix of conventional museum galleries and private spaces, which predominantly showcase the architectural heritage of Jaipur. Um, Esther mentioned this, so the uh, image on the left of the screen is uh, of Chandra Mahal, which remains with, um, uh, under private ownership, and the image she showed you was from that space, um, residence within the complex. So combined with the fact that we have a small team and small budgets, I can only describe our approach to curation and outreach as eclectic. Although we've had a strategic plan in place since 2015, the implementation tends to be project-based and piecemeal and often needs to be renegotiated based on the changing needs of the institution and the general family. We achieve most of what we do through collaboration. I'm going to speak about just a few projects today. Uh, the first of which was the, the major gallery that we recon reconceptualized and installed. It was the first in the 1970s, um, which is on painting and photography, and that opened in 2015. It covers the visual history of the visual arts in Nepal from the fashion of the city until the mid 20th century. The project took over two years, including reorganizing the documentation and storage of the calamities. For such projects, although there is an in-house curatorial team, of which I'm a part, we need to pull in the expertise of architects, designers, and conservators to realize our goals. In other words, each gallery is a major undertaking and investment for the Trust. But we believe it has paid off with what has been described by visitors as the best museum gallery in India. There is more space in the building for us to use, and we're working our way towards a new gallery, in, in, that, in the rest of that space. Just as soon as we finish revamping the transport gallery, which has been delayed by COVID until, until this October. So uh, you can be sure that will be a star attraction as well. So I hope, I hope I'm persuading you all to, to visit Jeopardy as soon as you possibly can. In addition to the city palace, my colleagues and I also oversee the galleries at Jagad, which is the historic fort above Amir, cared for by a sister trust stronghold of the Kachwahas, that is the Jaipur family, from its founding in the 11th century to 900 years later, in the middle of the 20th century, which is when it was opened to the public. We last opened a new gallery on the military and diplomatic careers of the last two Maharajas of Jaipur in 2013, and hope to revisit and renew this magnificent fort, beginning with a new gallery that we want to start work, start work on this year. We've also been extraordinarily fortunate in the super scholarship that we've been able to attract. I think you'd be hard pressed to find any um, Indian collection this well published. Of course, this has to do with print technology and publishing in general, having changed dramatically since the 1970s, which is when we last had some catalogs uh, published in the collection. But it also reflects the quality and diversity of the collections. We cater to specialist archaeologists interested in the material of archer's thumb rings, to historians of yoga and early modern literature, textile experts, geographers, and of course, we are also home to the unique archive of Maharans. His work was first made public in the 1980s, but as a result of the new gallery and its accompanying catalog, which you can see the cover of um, at the top left of your screen, uh, both of which uh, feature his images, we've been able to lend to exhibition as far afield as Canada, the UK and Israel, in addition to sharing these treasures with visitors and readers from within India and around the world. So although we're committed to new exhibitions and galleries, they do take us some time and 
So we invest heavily in books as a permanent, if you like, form of outreach and dissemination. And on that note, I'm delighted to share that a new book on masterpieces at the court is due to be published in the course of this year, uh, in which readers will hear from over 40 scholars and practitioners from around India and the world. This is what my colleague and I spent a lot of time doing, working on this book. Um, they range from established academics to early career researchers and the specialist conservators who have worked on our projects in the last 10 years. Um, because this is the working palace and not a museum alone, the levels of research access to the collection did vary prior to that period. Frankly, it can also sometimes be a thankless job to deal with collection stores in the peak of an airless Jeppo summer. But the wonder in and passion for these objects that comes across in this book through the work of all of these people makes us feel that the job's worth doing. And so the book really is a tribute as much to our scholars as to the collections, the Commonwealth Association of Museums. CAM is a network of post-colonial museums that reflects on colonial legacies and develops new international relationships and working practices. CAM has long had a focus on decolonization, indigenous and diaspora communities, and broader Commonwealth values. Since its funding in 1974, CAM's mission has been to empower museums and museum professionals to use their resources, their collections, exhibitions, programs, and expertise to support the sustainable development goals. I've been a member of years, I've served as a banana advisor, so you could argue this is a personal collection, but connection rather, but that is not in fact the case. CAM is great at supporting regional initiatives, something that I think we do inadequately in South Asia. CAM held two pioneering workshops on access and inclusion in collaboration with Jeffport and the Meranga Tribe. It resulted in two publications supported by ICOM, both of which are free to download from CAM's website. You get out of CAM what you put into it, I think, and, and Jaipur has both contributed and benefited hugely. We're probably the first Indian Palace Museum to produce a Braille guide. I know for a fact that participation in the 2016 workshop accessible changes to their displays, and we at Jaipur have used what we learned to develop tactile interpretive aid. In other words, it changed our curatorial practice. For those who may not be aware, CAM also runs a distance learning program and an internship placement funded by the government of Canada. And this is because CAM is registered in Canada, which makes it possible to apply for internships. But the important thing is that as a CAM member, we at JEPOR have applied successfully twice as an institutional member, not me personally. Uh, the first internship coincided with our first access workshop in 2016, but it also produced a series of booklets for young visitors, which is the image in the, in the middle of that slide. Uh, the internship is meant to be tailored to the host museum's requirements, so ours was creating educational material, but it also supports CAM uh, engagement and outreach goals in the region. Our current internship got somewhat derailed by COVID, but do please look up for an online exhibition titled Closer Ties that we're collaborating on with a number of Canadian collections of South Asian art um, that is a result of and a response to COVID preventing travel to India. I would encourage colleagues from South Asian and other Commonwealth museums to tap into CAM's professional network. But also, I'm intrigued and encouraged by the Center for Historic Houses initiative to create a network of palace museums and historic houses in India, and perhaps the wider region, because I think there's great scope for acting in concert, and it is important to find out how we can possibly do so. I've copped out a little bit on listing the full range of people who've been involved in the work that we've accomplished over the past decade. As I said uh, early on, we have accomplished what we've done through collaboration. So I'll end there. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. This was a fantastic talk and such a deep insight into the museum, the practice, um, collaborations, and it shows all your innovative um, approaches. And I've see, I, ha I have some of the fantastic um, books that you um, published. It's really a, a great example of you know, what can be achieved in India. So we are very interested from the side of the Center for Historic Houses to support this um, initiative in any way we can and um, through our own network with institutions um, abroad. So thanks so much. Um, 
uh, we'll uh, wait with the questions to the end. Please, everyone who would like to ask some questions, use the chat box. And ideally, if you could write a queue in front of it so that's more easily uh, for us to find. Um, I would like to continue now um, uh, with Rebecca. Um, if you could share your presentation, please. So we are um, delighted to have Rebecca Tills from the Hillwood Estate um, in the United States. And so we really like to have a broad variety of different types of historic house museums. And um, I think you already see from the two um, um, presentations we've had, um, um, you know, the outlook, the history of the collection and curatorial practice is extremely insightful. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you so much, um, Mimi, for inviting me to speak today on this panel. Can everyone hear me and see the, see the presentation? Yes. Perfect, yeah. wonderful, thank you. Well, um, um, once again, thank you again for, for allowing me to participate in this exciting international um, panel and featuring Hillwood um, in such an interesting dynamic context. Um, my hope today um, is to provide an introduction to Hillwood for those of you that are not familiar or who have not visited um, to, in Washington, D.C., um, to show you some highlights from the collection, illustrate some projects that I'm currently working on. Um, I also hope to illustrate some of our curatorial practices, exhibitions, and rotations um, in order to shed some new light on some exciting new partnerships and collaborations. Um, Hillwood uh, State Museum and Gardens is the final Washington, D.C. residence of businesswoman, philanthropist, and collector Marjorie Merriweather Post, a portrait of which I show you on the screen. Um, she was born in 1887 in Springfield, Illinois. Actually, her birthday was yesterday, so this, the timing of this presentation could not be more appropriate to, to honor her and her legacy. Um, she was the only child um, of C.W. Post, um, who actually was the founder of Postum Serial, um, a company that she inherited um, at a very young age of only 27 um, in 1914 after her father's death, which she actually grew in the later 1920s into a larger um, conglomerate called General Foods. Um, she purchased Hillwood um, Estate in 1955 and renovated it during a two-year period between 1955 and 57. And she actually passed away um, at Hillwood um, in 1973. In her will in 1968, she left the house and the collection to the public. Um, that we're very fortunate that there are very few restrictions um, as far as uh, renovations, collecting, deaccessioning, exhibitions, loans, all of that. Um, however, there's a mission, of course, to stay as faithful as possible to Marjorie Post's taste and interiors during her lifetime. Um, a very unique uh, aspect of Hillwood is that we actually are an estate museum and gardens. Um, we are also the only museum of decorative arts in the DC metro area, which really sets us apart. And we are not part of um, the federal museum system, but, uh, which, is, which is, gives us a little some freedom, but we are a public charity. Um, Hillwood sits on 25 acres of surrounding woodlands, 12 acres of which are formal gardens. And of course, you can imagine how grateful we are um, for uh, during the pandemic, of course, this last year, to have so much wonderful outdoor space, which has actually allowed us to remain open for the majority of this past difficult year. And just quickly, I want to just show you some of the beautiful gardens on the left, um, an image from the French parterre. These were all, again, renovated and installed by Marjorie Post, landscape architects, uh, during the 50, during the mid 1950s, on the right, a picture from the Japanese garden. Uh, we have a greenhouse and a cutting garden, um, and we actually use uh, live flowers from the cutting garden um, and greenhouse in certain rooms where Marjorie Post all, um, had live flowers grow in the mansion on display. Um, on the left is the rose garden, and this is actually where Mar the, the monument dedicated to Marjorie Post, where she is actually laid to rest, um, topped by this beautiful 17th century Italian porphyry uh, urn. And on the right, um, a nine-hole putting green, which she used and was an avid golfer, both in Washington and Palm Beach. 
Um, here is a front, is a photo of the, the front of the house, the Georgian style mansion. Um, here is a picture of the back and just a little bit about um, some of the architects uh, and designers that she worked with at Hillwood. Um, the house was designed um, long before Marjorie Post actually purchased the property. It was designed in 1925 for another Washingtonian family. Um, again, Marjorie Post purchased the property in 1955, renovated it um, with the help of uh, several architects and interior designers, landscape architects between 1955 and 57. Um, bequeathed the property and collection to the public in 1968, and the museum actually opened to the public in 1977, four years after her death. Um, Marjorie Post, in addition to being a philanthropist and uh, businesswoman, was also an avid collector. Um, Hillwood is sort of is the culmination of over five decades of Marjorie Post collecting. Um, as a young woman um, in Manhattan. Uh, during the late 19 teens, really began old master paintings, English and French 18th century portraiture, and then really quickly grew into a passion of French um, 18th century decorative arts. Um, her third husband, Joseph Davies, was actually the ambassador to Soviet uh, Russia during the late 1930s. Where, during um, 1937 and 38, Marjorie Post accompanied him to this mission to Moscow um, and began to, of course, uh, collect in much greater interest um, Russian, especially Imperial Russian, but 18th and 19th century paintings and Russian decorative arts um, that she had access to on the market post uh, the Russian Revolution and was able to bring home quite a few treasures from that, um, that period abroad and also continue to collect in that area even upon her return. So Hilbert is really a unique uh, combination of these two French and, and Russian 18th century uh, artistic moments. So entering the, the mansion, of course, you're greeted in the entry hall, immediately um, transported into an 18th century French palace um, with the, a, a French rock crystal chandelier and her Russian imperial portraits uh, on, on one side along the grand staircase. Um, I'm going to concentrate actually today on some highlights of French 18th century um, decorative arts um, because that is my particular um, area of expertise and, and I'm in charge of that part of the collection at Hillwood. So just opposite the, um, the, end, the great entry hall are these two fantastic French 18th century commodes, which I show you on the left. And here is a, a closer look at both of them um, attributed by, to the royal cabinet maker, Jean-Henri Riesner, who was actually the cabinet maker to King Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette. Um, both of these are um, fantastic uh, objects in the collection, highlights of our 18th century French furniture, really spectacular pieces as you enter um, the mansion. On the right, um, the commode, this particular Riesner commode was bought um, during Marjorie Poe's earlier career in the later 1920s when she was living in Manhattan, um, advised uh, by Sir, uh, the great art dealer, Sir Joseph Duveen. And this uh, piece actually has an interesting provenance. Um, it was in the collection of the fourth Marquess of Hartford, who uh, then left to his son, Richard Wallace, the, the founder of the Wallace Collection in London. And this was actually, this, this decorated his bedroom in his Parisian uh, mansion on the Rue Lafitte. So it has an interesting, um, interesting provenance. And the one on the left was bought actually as a pendant to the one on the right for Hillwood in the early 1960s from Duveen Brothers. Another reason I'm showing these to you um, is because um, my hope is to organize uh, a research examination of these two cabinets. Um, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar um, with an ongoing uh, research project and scientific examination that has been um, taking place in the UK over the last few years um, in collaboration with the Wallace Collection, Waddesdon Manor, and the Royal Collection, which recently culminated in a wonderful publication on this cabinet maker, Jean-Henri Wiesner. For those of you that have not seen this publication yet, I highly recommend it. Um, it came out uh, just recently in the, in the States and was um, released in the UK late last year. Um, the three institutions have been examining um, every piece of Reasoner furniture in these three collections. And it's my hope, um, it, was, it was actually scheduled uh, just after the lockdown. Um, uh, conservators from the UK were actually scheduled to come to Hillwood and look at our two commodes, um, take off bronzes, use XRF um, technology scientific examination to look at some of the woods, compare the dating and the materials to this 
existing database in the UK and be able to um, provide some additional information, scientific examination, uh, information, which I hope will again be rescheduled in due time. So I just wanted to mention that exciting uh, research project, which I hope will take place soon. Following the entry hall, I'm inviting you into the French porcelain room, um, which uh, is one of the areas that Marjorie Post um, was involved in actually installing these, um, these original vitrines and um, is a highlight uh, of her displays of early Vincennes and Sevres porcelain, predominantly for the this blue celeste color, this enamel color that was very difficult and expensive to produce in the mid, in mid 1750s. Um, one of the favorites of not only King Louis XV, but of Marjorie Post herself. And of course, just a quick reminder that the Vincennes Porcelain Factory was founded in 1740 and moved to be located to Sevres in 1756. It's spectacular objects from this early period of, of soft paste um, production uh, that Marjorie Post enjoyed collecting through over many decades of her, of her lifetime. Um, and with inch, wonderful connections um, to France and Russia. This, we have a, we're very fortunate to have an ice cup from Catherine the Great cameo service and other objects um, associated with some prominent diplomatic figures and um, wonderful, wonderful Rococo forms from the mid 18th century. Just yesterday, you're probably the first, the very first ones to see this new installation in the French drawing room, we're very fortunate. Again, these are some of these wonderful projects that are, are on the horizon and have, have come to fruition, which is so exciting for us. Um, we were very fortunate with the Frick's uh, closure uh, for two years during their renovation. The Frick Collection in New York has kindly lent us a long-term loan of this wonderful Dupacier, so Vienna, about 1730, um, terrain that was actually part of a much larger service commission for the Russian Empress Anna Ivanovna, which we have now uh, showcased next to our cup and saucer from the same service, alongside Catherine the Great's um, uh, ice cup and some other objects that have a diplomatic connection. So this new story that we're able to tell of um, por sorry, porcelain and diplomacy um, during this temporary display in the French porcelain room is really thrilling. Next uh, room that I just wanted to briefly walk through with you is the French drawing room. Um, this is one of two rooms um, that actually incorporates original 18th century French paneling, um, very much uh, arranged with French and company, uh, the interior designers based in New York that Marjorie Post worked with to install some of this original paneling um, in the mid 1950s. The room is also centered around three wonderful Beauvais tapestries from about 1730 after Boucher designs, one of which you can see a detail of on the right. Other examples of wonderful French German 18th century furniture, vitrines of, um, of small snuff boxes and objet d'art, which was another one, uh, passionate area of collecting for Marjorie Post, and some wonderful um, paintings. We'll see this portrait of Empress Eugenie a little bit later that was actually bought in the 1960s for Hillwood with its original 19th century frame. And of course, vitrines of more, more Vincennes and Sevres in the Blue Celeste and Rose Pompadour color that Marjorie Post was so fond of, which of course mimic beautifully the dress and the flower floral decoration of Empress Eugenie painted by Winterhalter in the middle. Um, the other room at Hillwood that incorporates original 18th century French paneling is the dining room. Um, the dining room, of course, Marjorie Post as a, an avid entertainer in Washington, D.C., of course, uh, still very much involved in diplomatic circles um, upon her return from overseas, um, entertained quite a bit, and of course used the dining room quite often for, for lunches and dinners um, monthly while she was in residence at, Washington, at Hillwood in Washington. Um, it also, it allows us, uh, one of the interesting um, op opportunities for us in the dining room is to actually bring out, uh, rotate services from storage twice a year and to set the table with many different pieces uh, that are in storage. Obviously, we can't uh, display all of our porcelain, glass, and silver at once, so it really allows us to rotate um, objects on the table regularly. And uh, we could actually set a table uh, 40 times without having to read, uh, 40 times for, a, for a, a table that seats 12 like this one without having to repeat any of the services. So it's quite an extraordinary collection and this, um, these rotations allow us to exhibit more of that area of the collection uh, regularly. 
Um, another area just adjacent off of the dining room that allows us to also that, that rotate some of the pieces um, from storage is the breakfast room. Um, this room is one of is often visitors' uh, favorite rooms. It's a small octagonal shaped little alcove overlooking the lunar lawn on the back of the house, um, often integrated with live flowers and orchids um, as Marjorie Post actually furnished the room, um, very much based on um, the architectural elements, ac the actual gilded brass architectural elements reused from her New York apartment in the 1920s, uh, as you see a photograph here on the right, um, but reimagined um, in a slightly new, uh, the new octagonal ceiling, um, uh, but this actually is a very, very similar setup to, uh, to the breakfast room in New York and allows us to also rotate. I think we have about 34 services for, uh, for four that we could rotate without having to repeat. So quite a bit of, um, of, of opportunity for us to do rotations. Another area in the house that we do uh, rotate on a regular basis twice a year, of course, is the jewelry and fashion. Uh, Marjorie Post was um, a collector of jewelry, passionate uh, collect fashion, fashion lover herself and left many pieces of jewelry and costume to Hillwood in her request. Some pieces were also given to the Smithsonian, but we're very fortunate to have some spectacular pieces. Um, she was an avid client of Cartier, of Van Cleef and Arpels, of Harry Wimpton, and David Webb, among others. And I'm not showing you an image here, but she was also um, fond of uh, Indian-inspired jewelry. And we do actually have a Mughal emerald brooch that was uh, mounted and, and sold by Cartier in the collection. So we do rotate the jewelry and closets uh, twice a year as well. And another area um, that allows us to, to do regular rotation is, of course, Christmas time um, or at the end of November through January, five trees uh, are um, in collaboration with our horticultural department are installed uh, both in the visitor center and at the mansion. So here I'm just showing you on the left uh, the most recent uh, Christmas decoration display in the dining room and on the right um, from the French drawing room with live, live flowers, I should say. Wow. <laughs> Um, we are very unique in the fact um, that we also, uh, in addition to being able to do some regular rotations in the mansion with keeping a, keeping really um, a, a, um, a focus on the permanent collection and permanent display, we do, Hillwood actually has two temporary exhibition spaces that are external, so on the, uh, on the property, but in, in, Jason, in the back of the mansion, so not attached to the mansion. Um, the one on the left is the Adirondack building, which was actually constructed after Marjorie Post's death, very much inspired by her summer house, Camp Topridge in upstate New York, um, which holds our exhibition, uh, exhibitions that open from um, June to January. And on the right, the dacha, uh, very much inspired by the Russian country houses that Marjorie Post would have, of course, seen during her travels in, in Soviet Russia which hold um, exhibitions from February through June. And this was actually built during Marjorie Post's lifetime. Um, just wanted to show you some uh, recent pr uh, projects. Um, this exhibition was uh, an exhibition that I organized in 2019 called Perfume and Seduction that um, brought to Hillwood, um, that showcased um, Hillwood's 18th and 19th century perfume bottles and accessories alongside a wonderful private collection by the, the um, company that is the manufacturer of flavors, fragrances, and cosmetics called Givaudan, based in Geneva. They have a private collection of objects um, similar to Hillwood's perfume bottles, accessories, atries, boxes, um, that it's housed in Paris and had never before been seen in North America. So we were able to bring the collection or highlights from the collection to Washington and show alongside Hillwood's collection, which was very exciting. And another um, exciting opportunity for us during this exhibition was actually to um, connect to our horticultural department and to extend part of the exhibition into the greenhouse with an exhibition or a display called Fragrant Botanicals that displayed um, plants and flowers involved in the making of perfume um, and had the olfactory pyramid for different nose, uh, different um, scents and different during the process of making perfume. So it was, a, it was a wonderful way to actually cross departments and to open up the exhibition to another part of campus. 
Um, the next exhibition that I'm working on that will be on view in the dacha um, is the one I show you here, um, which will open on February 16th uh, and close on June 26th, 2022. Um, it is um, going to focus more on hard paste porcelain, the discovery of porcelain in Asia in the ninth century and moving west to uh, Europe. First, um, the development of Kaolin and Saxony, Dresden, um, at mice and manufacturing, then moving to um, Austria in Vienna with the Dupac Cave Manufactory, and then to Berlin, the KPM Royal Manufactory, highlighting objects with a permanent collection of hard paste diplomatic gifts commissioned by some of these manufactories for uh, rulers, aristocrats, uh, and also the Russian court, influences on Russian uh, porcelain, and also um, some select some select loans as well. One of the exciting opportunities in this exhibition has been to actually integrate some contemporary pieces of ceramics uh, that relate to objects in the collection, um, such as Bauke de Vries. He is a Dutch ceramicist based in London. Bauke de Vries's memory vessel from 2015 that actually incorporates um, 18th century shards of uh, Femme Hiver porcelain mounted in a contemporary vessel. Um, Cindy Sherman's iconic Madame de Pompadour soup terrine from 1990 that will be juxtaposed with our Vincennes Le Celeste terrine, which we saw in the French porcelain room. And um, Chris Antman, who is uh, an American ceramicist based in Oregon, who did a residency at the Meissen Manufactory a number of years ago, has produced a series uh, called La Maladie. These figures, these porcelain figures, one of which I show you here called Harbor, will be opposed um, to many of our Mycin and also other continental 18th century figurines in the exhibition. Another um, exciting artist who I'm excited to feature in the exhibition alongside some of our other objects, of, uh, other loans of early mice and porcelain um, is the work of Roberto Lugo, um, who is an American ceramicist based in Philadelphia of Puerto Rican descent. Uh, very much, he's an activist, a ceramicist, a poet, uh, very much looking back to 18th century forms. So that will be a wonderful juxtaposition. And we're also excited to show, to feature some of some more of Roberto's work in the mansion uh, during the duration of the exhibition. So some larger scale pieces, hopefully something very similar to this larger vase and some smaller additional teapots to juxt juxtaposed with the permanent collection in the mansion. Um, but the, the real focus of the contemporary installation in the mansion um, during the duration of that exhibition will be Chris Antiman's um, centerpiece, or Surtout de Table, which she has commissioned especially for Hillwood that will be on display uh, in the dining room. It's not this one, which I show you here, which is entitled Fruit from 2016, but it will be something very similar, inspired by the colors and uh, the pink in the dining room and also the gardens and porcelain figures in Hillwood's collection. So we'll be extremely excited to show, to showcase both Chris and Roberto's work in the mansion alongside exhibitions in the exterior building. Um, Chris Antiman's display in the dining room will actually be the third in a, in a, in a line of um, contemporary ceramic exhibitions that have been featured in the dining room. The first one, uh, War and Pieces from 2019. This was Alpha de Vries again, who I mentioned earlier. Um, and on the right, an exhibition that is about to open in just a few weeks time, The Porcelain Flowers of Vladimir Kaneski, which opens April 6th. Uh, Vladimir is of Ukrainian, a Ukrainian ceramicist um, based in New Jersey, who again, very much inspired by Marjorie Poe's love of porcelain flowers and the gardens and our porcelain collection. So um, it's wonderful to have now sort of a, a series of three contemporary ceramic exhibitions that will be featured in the dining room. Another exhibition which I am currently working on, which will actually take place in the gardens, is Christine May's Rich Soil. Um, Christine Mays is an American uh, sculptor based in the Bay Area in San Francisco. Um, wonderful, innovative um, sculptures. She's made um, 29 of them in, in, of human, uh, human size, um, based on female, uh, human figures of, of um, 
base in, in, in uh, metal wire, excuse me. Um, and she um, first exhibited uh, this installation, Rich Soil, um, at Filoli Historic House and Gardens in Woodside, California. So Hillwood will be the second venue for this exhibition. Um, these wonderful figures um, will be spread out um, all over the campus. I'll show you that in just a second. Um, she's very much inspired by the dance troupe Alvin Ailey, the American mid 20th century dance troupe Alvin Ailey's Revelations. And this theme of dance in the gardens is so fitting for Hillwood. Um, it really ties in perfectly to Marjorie Post's love of dance, of square dancing, of the waltz, of Paso Doble. Um, she believed that dance was a wonderful part of exercise and encouraged her guests at many of her parties and dinners to participate at many of her different homes in Camp Topbridge, in Mar-a-Lago, in Palm Beach, and of course at Hillwood. And she was also a patron of the ballet, the Washington Ballet Theater, the American Ballet Theater, and the uh, Washington Ballet Guild. So the themes here, again, not just displaying contemporary art at Hillwood for the sake of having a contemporary uh, artist, but to actually really connect to the themes and legacy of Marjorie Post. But we're also extremely excited that we'll draw in, a, I think, a, a very new diverse audience. Here is a map, um, a layout of the different groupings um, where the, the pieces will be on display throughout the gardens at Hillwood. So there'll be 29 life-size sculptures uh, in seven different groupings. Here is an installation uh, shot of what the first grouping that, you, that a visitor will encounter as they're coming out of the visitor center just in front of the mansion entitled Soon, Very Soon. Just to whet your appetite and give you a sense of how these figures will add in wire, these flowing dancing figures will actually relate to the existing garden sculpture and a state. And there will also be an introduction to the exhibition in the visitor center um, with uh, text about the artist, about the exhibition, why it's at Hillwood, and more information about Marjorie Post's dance with a map. Uh, there'll be a video on the right with an interview with Christine Mays herself, and also installation shots of the pieces at Hillwood, and a case of, which you see here on the left, a case featuring Christine's tools, pliers, gloves, some of the, the, the tools that she's used to manipulate this very industrial, difficult material. And I just want to also just quickly show you some, uh, we do, as I mentioned, uh, loan and acquire uh, pieces. So some promise gifts and new acquisitions on the left. I thought it was very appropriate to show you a recent, relatively recent promise gift, this wonderful um, Indian knee hole desk that was made in the mid 18th century in Viscapatam, of course, the center for a lot of this trade um, in the mid 18th century, in a very English, towards uh, the third Ch Chippendale shape, but of course inlaid with um, ivory, uh, designs after Indian textiles, incredibly, in um, incredibly beautifully crafted. And ivory was another major area of interest, mounted ivories in the 18th century of Marjorie Pope. On the right, a very recent acquisition, um, just a matter of weeks ago, um, part of a service, uh, um, Haviland, and also American um, mid 20th century porcelain service that was used on Marjorie Post's uh, yacht, the Sea Cloud, which she commissioned to build in 1931. So we're wonderful. We're very excited to have some new pieces to add to the collection. And we do actually also lend objects, as I mentioned just briefly, a few objects that have been traveling over the past few years, and that some of these objects continue to travel. Seb Porcelain, this beautiful portrait by Winterhalter of Empress Eugenie in the middle, uh, which is actually about to go out on loan to the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts again in the fall, and our wonderful Ugro portrait of La Nuit on the right. Um, here is uh, an outline of the three exhibitions that will be featured at Hillwood this year. Again, this is the first time that Hillwood has actually organized three exhibitions at, uh, simultaneously. Um, so, of course, the first one, which we saw a glimpse of in the dining room earlier, the Porcelain Flowers of Vladimir Konevsky, that will open on April 6th, Roaring Twenties, that will open on June 12th in the Adirondack Building, and Christine Mays Rich Soil, which we just looked at, which will open June 26th in the gardens. Another exciting um, collaboration, which um, I'm working on at the moment, is um, a, what we call a spotlight exhibition, Marjorie Merriweather Post and, and the Diplomacy of Philanthropy, 
which is in collaboration with the National Museum of American Diplomacy here in Washington, which will be featured in their pavilion uh, next March, 2022. Um, focus, we're very excited to focus on Marjorie Post's um, time during uh, the 1930s as the wife of the ambassador to Soviet Russia and to Belgium. 37 and 39. We'll have um, three pieces of porcelain from the collection on view, um, pieces that she used in the embassies during her diplomatic service to entertain many of these important political uh, and, uh, political and uh, social guests. Um, and we'll have some photos and didactic material about her role as ambassadress and uh, how she used these pieces uh, in entertaining, to pursue or to further her diplomatic mission. And just to finish up, uh, we also have published a number of books of the last few years. Here uh, are a few most recent publications on jewelry, on Fabergé, a new biography on Marjorie Merriweather Post, and a very recent publication on the gardens by our executive director, Kate Markert. And one that is still, that is actually in process, that is due out next year. Um, this is a working title, a living collection, but um, it is a collaborative project between the curatorial team and the library and archives, uh, which will focus on Marjorie Post's uh, residences and highlights from the collection. And last but not least, I just wanted to mention that um, we are also in the midst of, of building a new collections and research center. Um, this space will house a new space for the library and archives, collection storage and facility workshop. Um, the library holdings are comprised of 38,000 volumes relating to Imperial Russia in 18th century decorative arts, as well as primary materials uh, related to post, post and the history of Hillwood and the archives. And I, I'm mentioning this because we'll be uh, really more apt to welcome uh, and offer uh, research space to scholars and fellows. So please. Do keep a lookout for DC area. Um, as I mentioned, Hillwood uh, is open with advanced registration required. Uh, you can follow us um, on Instagram. You can and look at some of our virtual programming on hillwoodmuseum.org. Uh, once again, I'm happy to answer any questions at the end. And I uh, hope you've enjoyed this, so this much. brief for Hillwood. Fantastic um, introduction to the museum. I'm so surprised to see all these activities going on you know, and collaborations and new exhibitions to really fill and fill this museum with life and revive everything. So I was very surprised to see the permanent exhibition as opposed to the um, kind of um, new exhibitions. And I would like to do uh, an exhibition on perfume and the history of perfume in, in, in India. Wonderful. Very nice. You know, uh, that sounds like a wonderful exhibition. And, and intrigued by what you showed us. Thank you so much. We are now moving to Colonial Williamsburg. Um, thank you very much, Janice um, Kennedy, uh, for, for coming to us. I know you are an expert in heritage interpretation and I really wish we had an extra panel just on this. It's a fascinating um, um, area. And um, I'm looking forward to your presentation now. <laughs> well, hello to everyone. I have I want to thank you so much for having me. And I have thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed looking at the fabulous pictures and places and all the objects, they're beautiful. Um, and so that's been a great privilege and I appreciate that. Um, I am an interpreter first, uh, supervisor of the Peyton Randolph House in the historic uh, Colonial Williamsburg Foundation. And so we set on over 363 plus acres. We are a city within a city or a town within a town and we are a historic capital city that's been restored. Um, and so we have over 500 buildings. Uh, the Peyton Randolph that I'm going to show you is one of them. And the Peyton Randolph is a very important building. It's a small ecosystem within itself that is original. There are portions of this house that are gonna date back to 1717 and portions that have been uh, added on to in 1754 when Peyton Randolph was actually here and inherited the house from his mother's will. And so he modified the house for his family. Peyton Randolph is a man who was cousin to Thomas Jefferson. He was one of the speakers of the House of Burgesses and thought of as the very first president of our Continental Congress. So if I could get someone to pull up um, my PowerPoint, um, which is called the concept, well, it's actually called Colonial Williamsburg, the art of self um, curation. 
and though it's a little different from what you all presented, um, I think is worthwhile talking about. Um, we curate our society, we curate our lives. And so I don't expect any answers, but I asked my question when I was trying to think of something to present to you all, curating, or what is it to curate? Um, a curator, what does that person do? What's their role? And if something's been curated, what does that mean? And I looked up Miriam, Miriam Webster's um, dictionary meaning, and it's like, mm, that wasn't quite what I was looking for, but it was something to work with. And I won't insult you all by explaining to you what I think a curator is, but I will certainly try to tell you how I connect it to what I do here as a supervisor, not only the Peyton Randolph House, but a historic area supervisor. Uh, if you've never been here before, as I said, we're a historical museum and we have over 500 buildings. And it's, um, it's what we do here is we try to create the past, make it relevant to the future um, in the present. And so, uh, what I want to do is show you the Peyton Randolph House through, through, through a few slides and then maybe go through an exercise with you all. You don't have to actually participate, but just walk through it with me. And then if you have questions, I'll be happy to address them afterwards. Uh, so I'll start with the first slide, the concept of curation. What does it mean to curate? How do we define a curating? Now, how do I define it? Next slide, please. Our goal for today to break down the following, what we know, what we actively don't know. And you might ask, how can you actually not know something? I'll leave that for you to think about. And what does it mean and how can I actively not know something? So that should be the critical thinking point. Next slide, please. We're going to do this exercise as we walk through the Peyton Randolph house. The hidden narrative and the story I see. If you were to take a piece of paper and split it in half, title one side the hidden narrative and the other side the story I see. As we look at these next slides of the Peyton Randolph House, pay close attention and write down any observations on one side or the other of the page, either under the hidden narrative side or the story I see. Next slide. Welcome to the Peyton Randolph House. This house sits on the Nicholson Street, which is a back street from the main street, the Duke of Gloucester in Colonial Williamsburg. You're seeing the front frontal view and a portion of the back as well. This house sits on four and a half to five acres of property. Peyton Randolph has outbuildings that sit directly behind the back that you'll see in the courtyard. And those outbuildings support this main house. This house from the front door, which is a nine and a half foot black walnut panel door that you're seeing from the outside, is facing the county court. To the right, you see a section of the house as well, um, which is uh, the main section that was there when the house was first put there in 1717. Peyton Randolph comes here as a young boy in 1724, about the age of three to four years of age. Next slide, please. This is the courtyard. This is the back of the house. And so if you were to look here at the very top, you see the windows, the roof, and here's this uh, compass window. This type of window we have here in the city, you would see it very visible in the College of William & Mary, which is to the west end of town. You would see it at the county court, which is directly across from this building at the front. You would see it on the east end of town at the Capitol, which is the government building. You would see it in Bruton Parish Church, which at that time the church was a government building as well. And so the presence of these windows are in all our government buildings. And by the way, our government buildings are all brick. It's amazing that Peyton Randolph took the time to put a compass window in his house and not on the front, but toward the back of the property. Over here, we have the breezeway. This breezeway was added on uh, or restored in the year 2000 or by the year 2000. It connects the main house, your living and social space, to the outbuildings that you would see some here in this side view, this photograph here. These are outbuildings or the uh, outhouses that the labor would live in and work in. So these buildings, this is where the, the intense labor work is done, provided for by those folks serving out here. And this keeps this building here afloat. So all of this is the back area of the house. 
this extensive courtyard is covered in shells. We sit between two rivers, the James and the York. And so a lot of the courtyard is just oyster and clam shells that we've pulled up from the nearby waters. This breezeway allows Mrs. Randolph, Peyton Randolph's wife, and those within to travel to the outside buildings that connect this main house. You have two worlds here and you have two families here, the Randolphs, Peyton and Elizabeth Randolph, and 27 of the 109 enslaved people that he has working for him on this property. So 27 people pass through, will, will pass through this connecting piece here to these outbuildings in the side photo. Next slide, please. This is the opposite side of that front door. It's amazing. You have the, the, uh, the reddish brown paint on the outside, but on the inside, you see the beautiful black walnut paneling. This is a nine and a half foot door. So you can imagine what the feeling is for someone who's being invited into this home to walk in a door that, this that is this tall. This is not a normal door. This is a thing of great uh, presence. These houses are sites of memory, and this door creates an image for all those who enter. The Randolphs represent the gentry class in this town. The time period we're talking about uh, would be in the 18th century. And so the Randolphs are here in the 17, middle 1700s. They are 2% of the town's population, a town of less than 2,000 people, where 2% are the gentry, those who own large homes, large tracts of land, and sit near government offices. So imagine this door being open and you're invited in and you come in and in this room, you see the broken pedestals here on the wall, uh, the, the uh, imported wallpaper, the grand stairway here. You see paneling at the bottom that's been painted in a beautiful blue with hand carved inlay. Over here to the right, the upper right, you'll see uh, a visual of the staircase from the second floor. And it starts here at the bottom and leads up and winds around. Here's that comp the, I'm sorry, the compass window that we saw outside. And if you look closely, you can see the outside of the courtyard. So you could imagine Mrs. Randolph being able to stand here at this window and see what's going on in her courtyard. The outbuildings, the workers, this is the perfect view. She would never have to leave her, leave her home, but she could see what was going on. But the opposite of that is those on the outside can see that they're being watched as well. Smart move. Next slide, please. Here's another visual of the doorway and the stairwell. This is the regular door that I say for the normal folks, or the regular folks. It's directly across from what would have been that nine and a half foot black walnut panel door on the opposite side of the room. So this is like a hallway or a foyer that allows folks to come in, <clears throat> excuse me, or a waiting area. And to the right here would be the entrance to the dining room. To the left here, a parlor, a place to parlay and chit chat. This is the morning sunlight. I want you to see what that looked like. Maybe this is the way it looked when Mrs. Randolph was here and what her guests would see as well. And if you go across this little hallway here and go on up to the staircase, you go to the second floor and that's where you find the bed chambers. But again, on the right here, we have a visual of the courtyard um, and those outbuildings. Next slide, please. There you have the Randolphs. This is the parlor, a place to parlay and chit chat. No sofas, but chairs, lots of chairs, beautiful carpets on the floor, imported carpets, uh, beautiful blue pa uh, paint on the wall paneling, walnut, as I said, with hand carved inlay. There, in this room, you don't see it just yet, but there is a fireplace with imported Italian marble in the surround, beveled mirrors that were encased in gold, um, also porcelain figurines that were imports. So obviously they have traveled around the world and they're being influenced by the porcelain and the Asian uh, artwork that they see there as well, and glassware. Here you have Peyton and Elizabeth Randolph. So if you look at the detail, the size of their portraits, how finely they're dressed, what they're wearing, how their hair is coughed and pulled back, and the velvet suede sheen to, the, to their, their clothes, and the silk and satin finish to her outfit as well, it, it points to a detail of wealth and status and power. Over here, we have the dining room, which is directly across from the parlor. And so you'll see that there's several mirrors here that, as I was speaking about, that are beveled and encased in gold. This one being an original that dates back to the time period when the Randolphs were here. We have a carpet on the floor 
that was not original to this property, but original to the time period. Up here on this wall, you don't see them uh, very clearly, but that is William and Mary Isham Randolph. They were Peyton Randolph's grandparents, Thomas Jefferson's great grandparents. And so in this room, you have their fine linens, um, the carpets with important marble in the surround of the fireplace. We have marble tables or marble side top tables. So in this room is where they would do a lot of politicking and find dinners and entertain the elite folks here in this capital city. And this is a place where Peyton Randolph did a lot of business uh, dealings as well. Down here, totally out of place, but here anyhow, here is a uh, shot of the bed chamber above stairs in Peyton Randolph's master bed chamber. That's where you would have found the bed furnishings and furniture for Mr. and Mrs. Randolph. And at the time of the inventory, when we reset this house, we're using inventory that was taken when Mrs. Randolph passed away. She lived eight years beyond her husband at the age of about 63. And we found at that time that she passed away, there were two beds in this chamber. We don't particularly know why. The bed furnishings are as valuable or more valuable than actual furniture itself. Over here in the corner, there would be, uh, you see the opening to a closet where a lot of their fine clothing and accessories were stored as well. Over here, there's the hint of a, wig that Mrs. Randolph would have worn sitting on her dresser, which is outlined in lace and ruffles, carpets on the floor. Next slide, please. This is a slide of um, the, ch the chimney mirror that's encased in gold. Here are the fine imported porcelain figurines. And this is a parlor shot. Um, there's more than one room that can be used as a parlor in this house. This one is below stairs. We have heat shields for the fireplace. If you were sitting here or Mrs. Randall was here taking tea, we assume that these heat shields would have been turned to deflect the heat away from her and toward the room if she was just a little too warm. And as I said, the fireplaces on the inside of the house burn coal. It puts out a better source of heat, but you can imagine the dust that would have settled in the hand carved inlay. And think about how this would have had been cleaned on a day-to-day -day basis. This house, the Randolph house, sits around the corner to the north side of town, and that's where you found the governor's palace as well. Another visual of Mrs. Randolph here. This is the, the uh, I'm sorry, the entrance to the dining room and the parlor right here. I want you to see how they were connected and close, um, arranged or close from each other, across from each other. Below here, this is the entrance to the breezeway. The Randolphs are the only one to have a breezeway at this time, and it connects the inside world to the outside world. So this door here that doesn't look like very much that's whitewashed, and the room is whitewashed. However, there are windows here. You can see that there is a spinning wheel. If someone had to do work here and didn't have a place or the weather was bad outside, this space could be used as a work area or as a place for people to come and uh, make entrance here and go into the courtyard uh, to, to the outbuildings to do work. But right here, this door changes because if we were to open this door towards us now, that beautiful blue that's here would be reflected on the other side of this door and a little paint makes a lot of difference. This door is the entrance to the room that I call Mrs. Randolph's um, Command Central. It's a space that's centered in the middle of her house and it has four doors and it allows her to enter uh, or access any portion of her house. So that's where she runs her house from the room on the opposite side of this door. Next slide, please. This is our kitchen. This is an 18th century kitchen. And this kitchen is second only to the governor's palace kitchen. Uh, Peyton Randolph is not nobility like the governor who represents the king or queen, but he is one of the most prominent families here in Williamsburg at that time. And there's still Randolph's here in the capital city of Williamsburg or in Williamsburg. Uh, here you see fine copperware. If you're familiar with cooking, copper is a fine distributor of heat. And so that's excellent to have in your kitchen. We've got pewterware over here. We've got uh, the jars for storing goods, more copper down here, um, copper on the table. We've got the dinnerware here for serving or for plating things. And so this kitchen, as I said, is second only to the governor's palace kitchen. This kitchen is used to prepare meals for folks coming to visit the Randolphs and for 27 enslaved folks who are going to be on this property as well. There's a, a fireplace in all of the rooms or in the outbuildings. These fireplaces do not burn coal as the main house does, but they run off of wood. And so Peyton Randolph's going to have wood brought in from his outlying properties um, as well. Over here, we've got a visual of the laundry room. 
but this is not just a room that, or space that's set up to be, do laundry. It can also be used as a scullery to skin, gut, pluck, scrape, to prep things, like a prep kitchen for things that are gonna be finished off in the main kitchen here. So if this kitchen here, the main one does not allow enough space to prepare all the dishes that the cook would need to prepare for that evening's festivities, there is a, an additional fireplace in all of the additional rooms. Sewing is done here. Sometimes you find equipment that represents dipping and molding of candles. Uh, all of that can be done in these spaces. So this is a multi-purpose space here. Next slide. This room here that looks unfinished, not pla no plaster, uh, not very posh, not very warm, not very inviting. This room here is a gathering space. And this is a corner of this room. So I provide you with sections and different um, views of it. This is where you would find the enslaved folks that are on this property who do not go into the main house, who are not working and living in the outbuildings. So this would be considered a quarter here in the city. Anywhere where enslaved folks are living and working can be considered a quarter. You're in the capital city and we wouldn't have the rough looking uh, slave quarters that you would find in the rural areas. So here you have some things here that represent the activities and the people that would have been in this space. Over here, you have what seems to be a, a bed. You wouldn't find these for everybody or fortunately find these in these rooms all the time. We just happen to have this one here. So imagine someone with the skills on um, being able to find the wood to make a bed, would put it here as a place to honor the elder on this property. Another fireplace to cook meals, to warm by, to have the light for warmth and to see, and some personal Put This here to compare, I'm sorry, the Peyton Randolph main kitchen. This one, there's a and this one here. I'll check and spin palace on as well as Mr. Ross or even and this would allow you to cook large pieces on these end irons and rotate them because he has a the man what more do these what do they say what do the illustrators they work live survive what do these spaces say what do you see in the spaces And so, art of um, self care to play the community around us and connect with help to everyone. That 